Welcome to the August update for the month of July, um, which, you know, has been quite interesting with the continuing trade war talk. And, um, you know, we, we're seeing this um, pressure on, you know, stocks on the JC and struggling to recover. And it's just been consistent, you know hit after hit after hit. So today we're going to be talking just about, you know, the where to from here. So thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, perhaps first let's just chat about, you know, what has happened or what happened in the month of July. Now, um, in July we had, you know, a big dip around about the middle of July and then markets recovered, but it wasn't satisfactory and pretty much, um, we closed off a bit flat on the month, so n no movement as such. But um, you know, we've had resources once again sort of coming under pressure, and um, you'd expect, or one would think, that because the rand has also sort of like been making moves towards the fourteen or thirteen fifty mark, um, we sort of expect that to look better, but it hasn't. Um, so can we just touch on? Why the dynamics we're so used to seeing aren't <laughs> yeah, played out? Yeah, you know, I mean the issue with resources is we've got to divide divide them into uh, the sort of the diversified Anglo Billet and Glencore. Glencore had their own story with the Department of Justice and mm -hmm. being an aggressive share buyback. Anglo and Billiton have actually done quite well. They've had good results. They've wiped down their debt to to frankly record levels um, and and are sitting in place you know they're sitting very very pretty they've got low desk debt piles they're nicely cash generative um, you know billiton selling an asset that can, can potentially give them a really nice uh, special dividend that's their shell gas assets they're selling it for 12 billion mm -hmm. uh, US no sorry 10.2 they uh, bought it for 12 billion um, and, and, and they've done very well, nice low debt levels, and now we're in that part of the cycle where they start doing mergers and acquisitions. And, and the argument is always they should do it at the bottom of the cycle when assets are cheap, but of course they've got no money at the bottom of the cycle. They've yes. got debt, they've got no money, they can't do it. Now's when they start to do it. Hopefully this time around they're a little more circumspect. <laughs> um, I don't know why they would be, because like you've seen this movie before, but, but you know, time will tell. Just, and, and perhaps just on that and making the point that, you know, the right time to buy is um, in the dip. I think, as you mentioned, uh, the set, selling of their shale asset, um, that was a particularly, particularly sore point for uh, investors because you bought this for this much, you're selling it at a loss, you want to go and buy more assets that are probably priced very high and what are the chances of... of as having the same situation. This is obviously, you know, shareholders are sort of sitting there watching it and going, wait, wait, hang on now. So the odds of having the same situation are probably better than even. Um, the show assets weren't, I mean, the Billiton paid 12 billion, sold for 10.2, spent a couple of billion on it. Mm. In the world of diversified miners, that's almost small change. Um, but that, that, that is the risk, and that is what shareholders are looking at right now and saying, hang on, guys. You know, and, and everyone's ter terribly excited about copper and the demand for copper and the like. But uh, these are cyclical, and there'll be more copper coming on stream. And by the time you've got yours on stream, is it still viable? Are people still wanting it? But certainly they're, they're sitting in a, good, in a good place in terms of debt levels, uh, in, in terms of, of, of the assets that they've done. They've streamlined the businesses. Anglo-American at one point was looking to potentially offload Kumba and anglo -Plan them kept both at the end of the day so they they quite nice uh, kumba's quite lacquer when kumba works which it is right now they just they're just a cash printing machine um their key secret is they've got a high grade of iron ore which helps them because your australian miners do it much cheaper but a much lower grade so that keeps kumba going the other single commodity miners are struggling platinum and as we record today on thursday implants has announced they're removing about a quarter of a million ounces out of the the, the, uh, the production they're shutting down 
Um, and the platinum price has fallen and, and uh, gold is doing nothing, platinum is doing nothing. Oil sitting in the sort of 70s seems comfortable there. Saudi Arabia quite likes it there because they want to list their oil company. Um, but your, your, your commodities haven't really been coming to the party. So the, the single commodity players really remain stuck. And I've got a, a very, very simple rule. To your point, you need to buy the commodity players when when they're at their worst and, and and how do you know when that is well you know especially in this environment yeah i mean kumba went to 25 rand yeah and everyone thought 200 was cheap and then 100 and then to me it's simple when the price doubles off its lows that's when you want to be buying it so you would have bought kumba for example at, at at 50 and it would have worked incredibly well for you so on your single commodity players watch for that watch for the doubling off the low um, because that means that that stuff's starting to happen. The commodities are starting to move. Um, in your platinum space, Implax is your riskier, but therefore more rewarding. Anglo Platinum, your your better quality asset, but therefore safer, therefore less reward when it happens. Um, and the diversifieds, I mean, Anglo and Billiton, I like them. If they pull back, I think there's opportunity. This is not a long-term buy and hold, bottom draw type of stock, but as long as they are running and they're in that space where they are, and they might... You know, when we talk about mergers and acquisitions and we're terrified of one of them overpaying for an asset, they might be a target as well, which means we could get the premium coming through on that side. Suddenly a offer hits the sense announcements and there's a you know, 20, 30, 40% premium coming through on, 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 on the prices. Mm -hmm. So the diversifieds are, to my mind, probably the place. And, and I ignore Glencore. I don't like the Department of Justice. Actually, yeah. I take that back. <laughs> I love you, Department of Justice. Just don't come knocking on my door. Please. <laughs> um, so it's Anglo and Billiton, and they're both in robust health, um, which means in five years' time they probably won't be, but for now they most certainly are. Um, and perhaps <coughs> let's turn our attention to the industrials and tech and telecoms, um, because that has been a very interesting sector, um, largely because of NASPERS and the NASPERS effect, yeah. which um, really, you know, when you look at the performance of the all share, you almost, you know, it's very difficult at the back of your head to sort of be like, okay, but I need to discount or take the NASPERS effect out. But um, I think if you look at the performance of industrials, the NASPERS effect is pretty blatant, you know, and it has done just so much you know to move the market and really um sort of put us under pressure we had earlier in the year when they announced that um they're um setting down their stake in <coughs> ten cent mm -hmm. that had a very you know we had like almost half a month of it just that yep. share price just going down you know and went up a bit went down again and it's just been like i was looking at the chart it's just been like a zigzag up and down up and down up and down and can we expect that to settle anytime soon? I mean, they're, they're, they're doing some interesting things, you know, in the e-commerce space and um, buying up what they need to buy up and, you know, being bought out and taking profits where necessary. But, um, you know, it, it's very difficult, A, NASPERS is big, Tencent is huge, and trying to, you know, it's, it's almost as if you need to wipe out the effects of the one to wipe out the effects of the other and it just it's all like a connected chain of big moving things that you know when they move just marginally the whole market they shifts. do i mean naspass is a quarter of our top 40 it's a third of our nd25 um and for many years for many many years six seven years the nd25 i mean it rallied from around twenty three thousand to seventy five seventy eight thousand driven predominantly by naspass and sab miller Th those were the two stocks driving it um and now naspass is under pressure i still like naspass around three thousand uh czar if it gets back to that point the trick with it is I and mean, there are a couple of points still at a significant discount to tencent we've got tencent results due in a couple of weeks uh, I think there's a quarterly uh, results coming out to sort of towards the end, maybe second week of, of, of August. Um, that will give us some thought. I also wonder, so Tencent itself, it's down about $140 billion. So it's in line with what Facebook and other stocks, sort of troubles that they've had. Um, I wonder as well if it hasn't perhaps been caught up in the whole trade war scenario around China. And, yes. and, and there are a couple of important points there. One is that obviously 
the Tencent product is predominantly within China, although not truly so. Fortnite as a game um, is, is a Tencent product, one of their, but you know, it's not steel or, or any of the other products that, that are having potential trade barriers or yeah. tariffs labeled onto it. But the concern might just be around China. The concern might just be on a Chinese economy which is, is looking vulnerable, and I'll touch on that in a second. Um, and therefore people saying, well, with that in case, that being the case in point, Tencent is perhaps under threat. If anything, Tencent's growth might slow. It has been slowing. And that's the symptom of size. It's the same story that Facebook has. Mm. You get bigger, your, your growth slows, your, your, your rate of growth slows, your, your cost of, of uh, expenses, your growth of expenses increases, and that therefore squeezes your Please, margin. Yeah. That's just a, a, emerging bus a, a maturing business. And much like ten uh, Facebook has run into the problem of they got two and a half billion monthly active users. If we take planet Earth, seven and a half billion. If we remove China, six billion. If we remove people under 15, they're almost at, at, at capacity. And, and in a space we've never seen before, where a company runs out of people. You know, you've always liked there's been more continents, more countries, more, but they're just running out of people. Yeah. Tencent's in a similar sort of situation in China, where they've got 800, to a, to a 800 million to a billion uh, active monthly users in a population that's one and a half billion. Again, remove your young, your old, remove your rural, and, and they pretty You're much done. saturated. That said, things such as WeChat is going to continue being used, and WeChat is everything from DD, which is car rental, to, to payments, to games, to communications, to everything else. Everything. The bigger picture, perhaps, is just China. We saw GDP number out, uh, was it 6.7, down from 6.8, um, which for the world's second biggest economy is a giant number, but is slowing. We used to consistently get seven, and that's coming off and causing some alarm. Uh, we've seen uh, issues with the currency weakening. The other trick, a couple of weeks ago, they, they loosened controls on, on banks, uh, capital adequacy. Yes. And you do that for one of two reasons. One, because you think your banks are massively sound, or two, because you want to get some capital into the market. So re relax the capital adequacy ratio, they'll lend more and that'll get cash into the market. And the view is generally that it's probably the latter. the latter. But certainly, you know, a year or two ago, we were talking about zombie Chinese banks to the tune of perhaps a trillion dollars, which truthfully, China can write a check for. They've got more than $3 trillion of US Treasury bills. Um, that those concerns have gone. They've been, you know, the, the economy is probably better than than it was, or certainly the the banking side a couple of years ago. But there is concerns that that as it morphs from a development economy, which is what drove the the commodity boom up to two thousand and eight, mm -hmm. into a consumer driven economy, um, it's it's not going to be a pain free experience. I think that might be concerns around Tencent. All that said, I think Tencent remains an amazing company. The fact that it's in China gives it protection. Uh, in that the Chinese government is not just going to let any new uh, upstart come along and, and threaten its yes. dominance. Um, and and NASPAS is trading at a massive discount to it. What shareholders of NASPAS want to see is NASPAS doing something with their other businesses. You mentioned the sale of Tencent. They also uh, exited Flipkart, selling yes. that to Walmart, raised a couple of billion dollars in that. They're paying down some debt, they, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there's a sense of all the other bits that they're doing is completely sort of disappears into the ten cent shadow and how do they fix it? And there's talk about perhaps spinning off the other assets, perhaps listing NASPAS and other exchanges and the like. Um, that might help. At the moment, if you want ten cent, you can buy at Hong Kong, you can buy the ADR in America, you can buy NASPAS in Johannesburg. If you buy NASPAS you get it at a discount. Hence a lot of activity and interest okay. in, 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 in that space there. But they they're looking at ways of unlocking. In truth I think it's also just part, just general lack of confidence in the, in, in the South African investment space. To your point around July, we were up, we were down, we were sideways, and we ended up doing nothing, nothing for an entire month. Mm. And um, perhaps a very interesting um, debate that's been going on is the Netflix versus multi-choice um, <coughs> yes, TV uh, <laughs> debate, which um, I don't know if, in, if you've seen it, Simon, um, but Netflix has a very hilarious um, ad you know, poking fun at, um, you know, the whole process of setting up, a, 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 you know, a decoder and getting a satellite and installation and things like that. But, um, you know, and it's given rise to very interesting debate, I suppose, about, um, A, the future of television, but also, um, you know, how safe or not safe were the perceptions around, you know, um, 
where DSTV is headed. And it's been very interesting seeing, you know, the, the, the several arguments. So one is, yeah, Netflix is great and cheap, but you need data, and, you know, that means more people yeah. buy data, and people watch DSTV for local shows, Nas um, and Netflix doesn't really have local shows. And it's been a very interesting sort of debate in the public, but I think how NASPA's management versus multi-choice management have handled what's going on, um, you know, has been quite interesting as well in, in that, you know, to run to the regulator and go, eh, well, you know, and then you've got people who are going, yeah, but are they really a broadcaster if, you know, their services are available worldwide? I can, you know, just log in, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, we are based in South Africa thing. So, um, where do you see that playing out? And, you know, so it's going to get tricky. I mean, if we look at if we look at multi choice, um, yeah, they were only ever in the spotlight for uh, idols or, or rugby or something like that. And then suddenly, I remember the ANN Seven deal, which they handled incredibly badly, and they came with a report, and and Bruce Whitfield said, "Well, how much did you pay?" And they said, "We weren't sure." And it's like, "Hold on, you did a six week report and you never quantified the number." Um, the Ashford Williamson uh, uh, racism allegations, yes. and 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 they 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 go into the regulators not completely unfounded. They they're raising some points which are probably with a discussion. For example, multi-choice um, has a BE structure as a requirement to operate in the market. They have a local content requirement. Uh, 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 sorry, the net Netflix has none of this. Mm. So perhaps there's a debate there. But the, the bigger picture is is that the internet is disintermediating. If we look at the telcos couple of years ago they wanted to do something about the sort of whatsapp and facebook messages of the world because yes. they were we no longer do sms which is sms is charged at like three thousand rand a gig um they love sms we have worked out that whatsapp and there's other better cheaper ways of doing it and the telcos tried something ghana currently has a tax on 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 these these uh whatsapps etc it's, it's literally a couple of cents a day but there's yes. been this massive backlash and I think the Ghanaian government has actually now pulled back on it. Um, but it, it, you know, the, 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 the multi-choice has the rest of the continent, which still does great for them. Of course, what's happening here will happen there. Make no mistake, this will change. They've still got the challenge of data. You know, not, not, not few people are on, on high-speed, uncapped uh, data connections, which at a cheap level are probably 500 rand, which, sure, that's half the price of DST Premium, but that's still 500 rand. Yes. You can get a DSTV compact for under 100 bucks. Um, and so they're going to face challenges. Their big thing they have right now, obviously, is still sport, uh, and that's going to remain in place. There's a lot of talk that they will start putting sport into standalone packages, and if you look what's happening in the European and the US markets, the answer to that is no, <laughs> it's not going to happen. ESPN has finally done it, but ESPN, remember, a subsidiary of Disney, rather than being owned by one of the telcos such as Comcast, Verizon, yes. or that. Um, and, and Netflix in and itself starts to run into problems. And the problem with Netflix is, is your competitive advantage initially was that you were first mover and that was really great. But a lot of the stuff that Netflix is doing is, is they buying the rights. So take, for yeah. example, Disney. They have the rights to Disney. Disney's just launched the uh, ESPN app, which is their own product, standalone, I think $5 a month, likely to do very well. Make no mistake, Disney's looking at their entire library and saying, well, How why don't we, we have Disney over the top charge $10 and you get access to Every everything Disney? And you pull it from 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 Netflix, and Netflix then ends up as a a sort of um, originator, original content creator, predominantly with little other licenses. HBO, you know, again, who who you can get the app in the US. Are we going to start seeing more splintering? And the dream that we had was instead of paying a thousand rand a month to DSTV for premium, <clears throat> we would get uh, one or two services, and we would end up paying two two hundred and fifty. The truth of the matter is that if we, if we want the same range that we had in terms of we want sport and we want Game of Thrones and we want this and that and the rest, we're going to end up paying the same price. <laughs> it's going to end up at the same price. It's just going to be multiple little services. DSTV's day in the sun of easy money, which is now 30 years in the making since they launched in Mnet in, in the 1980s, is frankly fading. And, and they can kick and scream. And even if, you know, 
the Netflix makes local content. They're, they're producing in South Africa, they're producing Indian content in India, and Pakistani in Pakistan, and so on and so on. Um, they, 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 they will never do the BEE. They're always going to argue we're an international company. We're not subject to that. Mm. But in terms of local content, there will be some. That, that's how you attra attract. Yes, yes. Um, and, and DSTV is going to find that a lot more complicated. 20 years ago, there was just them. And, and then slowly, there's, you know, we've got more and more options that have come through. We can debate the quality of those options, and I can't even remember any of their names, which suggests <laughs> the quality of it. Yeah. But yeah. but that is ultimately it, and they're going to have to fight to protect their turf. But I mean, they they they're the incumbent. They've got the money. They've got the budget. They've got the rights. Um, and yeah, for example, Game of Thrones everywhere in the world is on HBO. In in South Africa, it's been on on Mnet. DSTV, or Mnet slash uh, um, their one Showmax. So yeah. it pops up on on, on Showmax there. <coughs> And that's the other flip. They're in that space already. They're trying to compete. They're rolling Showmax into the rest of the world to try and say we've got an offering counter. End of the day, for NASPAS, it's no longer been the big granddaddy for them. You know, mm. Tencent has taken has over been, in, yeah. in, in, in that space. If we go back far enough, once upon a time it was their printer publications. Then it became their TV publications. Now. now it's their, their Tencent. And truthfully, what NASPAS is trying to do, as much as they will fight the rear guard with, with multi-choice, their longer term plan is actually to find something that, what's next after Tencent? Is it OLX? Is it whatever it might be? They thought it might be Flipkart, something like that. They, they're not going to go backwards, they're going to go forwards. Forward. And we will, I mean, one day we might get a standalone sport package, but you know what, they're going to charge you 600 bucks for it, because why? People will pay it. Yep. Now, what is a game of sport worth? What the market will demand? And they're not going to do pay-per-view. Because they know that pay-per-view is not going to work. They, they're going to bundle it up and sell it to you in, in, in one lump sum. Um, and, and that's how they're going they, to they, they're, they're continue to... And this idea that, that we'll be able to spend a couple of hundred grand and get all our TV viewing, it's not going to happen. It's going to cost you hundreds and hundreds. Or you cut your TV viewing. Read more books. Oh, good luck. <laughs> Trying to get um, that to happen in South Africa. We love our TV. <clears throat> um, and I suppose... Maybe let's move as we're we're starting to see results coming through. Um, you know, Liberty, Absa, um, and we're going to see more and more of those. And I suppose the big question is: we're halfway through the year. Which industries are you expecting to? I don't think anyone's going to blow the lights out, <laughs> um, but um, we might have a couple of surprises, good ones, and I anticipate we'll have a lot of not so good surprises as well um so do you have any stocks that you're particularly looking at um on the good side um and the bad side so the updates that we've seen trading updates particularly from the retailers have been at best bleak uh willies remains in deep trouble mass yes. smart mass smart can't do anything right etc there's nothing pretty looking there um shop right interests me the results weren't great but down at the 210 ish level shop right interests me i'm not buying anymore because I, I i almost get special treatment at my shop rights i have so many shares for me <laughs> not for whitey person type of yes. lots of shares but um but it you know not because I think it's going to shoot the lights out, but because of that price, I think it's offering decent. Nedbank seems to have got Echo Bank working finally. Finally. Um, which means their trading update was really strong, but I think the market's kind of expecting that. Yes. I tell you, and I had dinner with a friend the other day, and he sold some shares for an unrelated story, and he's sitting on some cash, and he said to me, so what do I buy? Um, and we eventually agreed on whiskey, because, you know, <laughs> there, there's... It's tough out there. It really is tough. And, and, and the, the companies are doing very well in a very tough environment. But what you've almost got to do is either you've got to say, look, let's look forward to the 2020 financial years. In other words, we're looking two, maybe three years ahead. And then, you know, ShopRite at 210, 215 is a great price. Truth is, you might be able to buy ShopRite at 215 in a year. You might be able to buy it at 185 for a year. So, so the question then becomes, well, why? Why, are we, you know, why go down that road? Now, you know, I do it. It's my strategy. It's just how I invest. I grab the dividends along the way and I, 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 I hold tight. Um, where things are starting to get interesting and massively risky is in the, the very, very small cap space. Because we've got some stocks there that have, and I'll name two, Ellie's and Arsenal Mittal, which, which frankly are both swear words, um, and have both been beaten down you know, to within an inch of their life. But survived. Ellie's just reported $0.08 cents headline earnings per share. The share's trading at $0.32. Cents. That's a four times PE. 
they've still got some challenges, make no bones about that. Um, but you buying them on a four times PE, that that that's not bad. You know, even if they're if the next year ends up only being six cents, you're buying them on a five and a half times PE. That that's not expensive. Mm. Yeah, they're a consumer stock, but this is more recovery story. Arsenal Mittal is selling their Max Steel International for two billion. Yes. Czar. Uh market cap's about four billion. Um, they've paid their debt off. Results were out. Was it Monday, Tuesday? They've massively paid their debt down. They're going to be generating about a one and a half billion free cash flow a year going forward. But if you're buying that stock on about a twice annual cash flow, and maybe there's some opportunities there as well with the trade tariffs on steel. Steel in America just became more expensive. Yeah. If it came from China, there might be opportunity. But whereas, <clears throat> excuse me, a year ago we could have given a sweeping statement and said. A year ago, it would have been, I would have said to you, financials were my big pick and probably resources second and leave industrials alone. Mm. Fast forward to August this year, um, it looks skittish out there. And, and part of this is probably we're falling into the darkest before the dawn and, and, and the brave folks are out there and, and picking up you know, quality assets at, at, at decent prices. Discovery below 150, shop right below 220. Woolies are almost, yeah, I mean, Woolies, but I mean, at this point, I just, I mean, Australia is such a disaster. You wonder if they don't eventually give it away to somebody. Um, just get it out. Yeah. So, so you know, if, if I had to pick a sector, probably banks. And I'll tell you why, because they've come through very strong. We spoke last month about yeah. how, or maybe the month before, um, then their, 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 their impairments, their bad debts are at, at record lows. They've been very careful with their lending, in part regulatory, but in part just being just cautious. Being cautious yeah. They're incredibly well capitalized. And the first sign of green shoots in our economy, they can gently, ever so gently, start opening those taps in terms of lending, start picking up their non-interest revenues. Um, and none of the banks are looking overly, overly expensive at this time. If anything, for current conditions, they're fairly valued. If conditions start to improve, they, they, they're looking attractive. And th they've held up. I noticed, I mean, Capitex back above the Viceroy price. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was 9.11-ish when Viceroy happened, and I saw it back at, at, at 9.40. The thing with our banks is they're just so incredibly well run and well managed and, and have been over the last decade um, that they're... they're They've almost got lazy balance sheets, lazy in the sense that they haven't been out there taking risks, which means they've yes. come through an incredibly tough time very, very well. Without actually having to do any And gymnastics. they haven't gone and bought a burger in the UK or a shopping center or shopping oh. thing in, well, in, in, in Australia. Well, maybe for well, Altamore. Well, no, sure. There's, there's <laughs> been, I mean, and, and, and Echo wasn't the best deal, and fortunately... But they've managed to turn it around, yeah. at least. Um, so, so, so time will tell. And, and it, 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 it's... I'm, if, if I look at, and in fact I was having this conversation with a couple of people over the last couple of days, um, and I mean, there's either broadly two views of our economy right now. And the one is that it's over, um, and that if you haven't got your, your ticket to, to wherever, you're, you're, you're too late because by now the queues are too long. Or the other is, is that we've probably bottomed. And I'm, a, we've, I, I'm of the view that we've probably bottomed, that yes, the 2.2 minus 2.2 GDP in Q1, there were some statistical issues around that, but it was a horror number. Um, but I think that, that the worst is probably behind us. And the evidence to that is that simply, and, and you know, SAA moving back to uh, out of Treasury and that sort of thing, PRC, we, we're seeing it. The trick was, we've spoken about this before, Soroma Posa became president in late Jan, cabinet in February. We thought, yeah, by Easter, sorted. No, no I mean, <laughs> and you made the comment. In fact, look at Steinhoff. We're eight months in, and they still know nothing. Um, you know, this is a country we're talking about. And, and there's several examples, you know. Like we said, Ecobank. Yeah. There's Liberty. Turnaround strategy, it's not It's an incredibly thing. slow. And yes, we wish that there were a lot more people facing charges and having the, the hawks, the scorpions, whichever one they are now, they're the scorpions. They've changed it again. Yeah. The, the formal National name Director now, they've started using that. <laughs> knocking on their door. And, 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 but truthfully, we are seeing it. We just, you know, as human beings, and, and we blame it on Twitter, but, but I have no doubt that when, you know, when, when posting first came along and the telegraph and the fax machine, it's always just been the flow of information has only ever been faster and we've only ever been in a hurry for things to happen. Mm. We're, we're, as a species, we're not particularly patient. No. Um, and this is going to take time. And, and, you know, the evidence, Peter Bruce writes today that Sura Mopoza has probably been led by his party. Now, there's two, you know, that might not be the worst thing. Should have 
should a leader lead or be led? I mean, we could debate that. The point being, there's going to be times when it looks like he's being led, and there's going to be times when it looks like he he's is leading. leading. Um, politics is messy. Turning around is slow. Uh, and we have truthfully probably come through the, 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 for want of a better phrase, the Zuma years. It could have been worse. Um, and perhaps there's an ever so this idea. So the big issue is ESCOM quick rabbit hole, let's go down there. Their debt is simply too much. They're unsustainable. So how do you solve it? Well, the government can't write a check. Private investors aren't going to write a check. Can't the, exactly fight the, the, the Chinese might write a check, but I'm not sure we want to now be colonized by the Chinese. Nothing against Chinese, everything against being colonized. Um, or maybe it's imperialized. Um, but the idea of swapping PRC debt for equity, and I know that there are many, many issues around it, but we could suddenly potentially wipe a third of ESCOM's debt off. That does a couple of things. It might actually if you get us upgrades from our rating agencies a little bit quicker. Mm. Owning ESCOM is not, uh, owning a functional, viable, profitable ESCOM is not a bad investment. It's a utility. It's actually not a bad investment. And that, and that then means that ESCOM hasn't got this debt burden, which is frankly killing them at this point in time and makes SAA and other debt issues. The others don't matter. It's just ESCOM. ESCOM. And, and that might be a clever, crafty way out of it. It's just going to be slow. It's just going to be slow. So back to your initial point. If, if, if I'm forced banks, if you're looking for some risk, uh, probably you shouldn't. There's some small caps out there. But, but you know, this is not for widows and orphans, and this is not a go big or go home. This is a like, you know, put your pinky toe in because you might lose it, and we don't really need a pinky toe. Yeah. Don't put your big toe because you do need that one. Put the pinky toe nail. <laughs> Something <laughs> like that. Um, and and, and, and my sense is that, that, that you know, that, that the light will start getting a little bit lighter. And when we talk this time next year, post national election, um, I'm not saying it will all be roses, but I do think it will be better. And I hope like heck our market is higher because it's now been four years and what I'm seeing is people coming to me and wanting to do alternative investments. They want to invest in cows. They want to do invest in beehives. They want to, and the reason I suspect, because the returns are you know, in the, the low teens. The reason is because they look at their, their, their top 40 returns. They've done the right thing. You've bought your ETF. You've bought your shop rights. You've like got a, and you, your granny who put money in the bank has beaten you. <laughs> and you're despondent. <laughs> and uh, you know what? You shouldn't be, but I, I, I feel your despondency. Um, and um, in terms of the bottom half, uh, what are your thoughts on can, can <coughs> we expect... What is the one thing you think this is definitely, it's not going to make it in the second half? So, I mean, the, the, the even three, if it's just a sector. The, the three sectors I'm very worried about. I remain deeply concerned around construction. Two exceptions Wilson Bailey and Afrimat. Um, Avenge, the takeover panel just blocked just the deal. Happening. Avenge is un, just not happening. That deal is not going to happen. And I, I mean, someone asked me on Twitter as I was coming here, does Avenge survive? The answer is probably not. No. Construction just remains really, really tough. Wilson Bailey, the only exception, but there's no reason to be buying Wilson Bailey. And frankly, even at this point, not Afrimat. You, you know, you don't have to get ahead of the curve. You can wait for the green shoots. Um, and, and, and so that's really tough space. And then the single commodity miners, platinum and gold. Um, we, I think we spoke we last spoke time, three gold. quarters of gold miners are not, are not profitable, no surprises there. Goldfields hasn't been able to get South Deep working, hopefully they will in time. Um, platinum price stuck in the 814 as I was coming here earlier today, uh, that's not a viable price. Anglo Platinum is, 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 is managing, but managing is the word. Um, Lonman announced to today they're reducing uh, uh, output, they're retrenching a massive number of people going to cost them two billion rand but they're only taking out a quarter of a million ounces we do production of around six to eight million so it's not it's not significant enough um but it, it, what it does for them is it takes their higher cost out so the, the platinum space i think the companies will probably survive but you, you know wait for platinum to to really start moving wait for lonman to be a 40 rand share then you buy it or Sabania, and I don't even know what Sabania is, or, or, or not Lonman, sorry, Implant, mm -hmm. 40 right. Wait for that 100% move and, and, and then get in. And then our manufacturing is still just, we don't have much manufacturing left. What we do is, is really struggling and, and is, is not coming in, in, any, in any hurry at all. Um, it's just not a fun place to be. Um, and, and then last but not least is the sort of second tiers. And, and what we, uh, 
what I mean by second tiers is let's look at the fast moving uh, the the quick service quick service restaurants, uh, QSRs, and you know we've got your famous brands, your Spur, the two big granddaddies. There, we've got a couple who've tried to come in behind it, um, and I think their bus is gone. And the fact that we just don't have, and I'm talking here taste, I'm talking gold brands, uh, and there's another which escapes my mind. They've come too late to the party, mm -hmm. and they our market is too saturated for them to get to that critical mass because you can't fight against famous brands because they've just got all the clout. They've got yeah. the kitchen, they've got the logistics, they've got the pricing power. There's we're not going to see another thousand plus uh, or five hundred plus franchise suddenly appear in this country. Um, those that are there ha have 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 got in, have muscled their way in. The space is over traded as it is, and there's just no more coming through. So. When I talk around those little stocks, the eddies and the arsenal middles, you've got to be careful. You've got to do it when you see the evidence. Don't look at taste and say they'll come right. Because no, I mean, they might not come right. Look um, at the whole picture. You want the evidence. When, when taste is making profit, now they're starting to come right. Whilst they're still loss making and in desperate need of money, just leave them Those. alone. Be incredibly selective. Because I think they, I think we're still going to see a lot more casualties directly into business rescue, indirectly in the form of delistings. Oh, sounds a bit hectic. And perhaps as a closing off point, um, the Bank of England mm. has very interestingly um, increased their um, interest <coughs> rates. And once again, we're sort of. I don't think we can expect what's happening in the U.S. So um, where we're seeing, you know, like the ten-year <coughs> Treasury keeping like flirting with that three percent line but um it, it it looks like as we're going out of the um quantitative easing phase and you know there's there's just a bit of movement and shaking up and trying to open um those taps and get consumers to like stimulate the economy do you think um that move by the Bank of England is actually going to be definitely not as big as what um, we've seen in the US in terms of its effect on emerging markets in South Africa. But do you think we should keep a close eye on it nonetheless? Um, especially because then there's the whole Brexit mess and you, yeah. you, you're sort of like, I mean, it's great, but you know. So the BOE, the, the BOE Bank of England is, is interesting because of Brexit. So they're raising rates, a little bit of inflation coming through, but, but uh, Mark Carney's got I mean, he's got one and a half eyes on Brexit. Um, and the statement he made the other day was, I forget how much, like half or three quarters of his time is, is, is taken up around Brexit. Brexit and yeah. and 0.75 puts them at the highest rates in, in nine years, 2009 since then. Um, but if we look at Bank of Japan left unchanged, some, some, some tweaks in terms of how they're doing it, but they're still targeting 0%. They, they're keeping their quantitative easing going. Uh, European Central Bank ECB, again, unchanged, uh, keeping their QE going, but have, have, have indicated they're going to start lightening late this year into late next year. Um, the Federal Open Monetary Policy Committee meeting from Tuesday evening, uh, left rates unchanged 8-0. But they were not expected to. We we're probably going to get September and and uh, December rates. The important thing for America, for the Federal Reserve, was that they said the economy is strong, and the evidence is there. Four point two percent GDP. Now there's some anomalies in there. For example, exports doubled, and that was probably ahead of of fears around tariff wars. Tariffs, get your yeah. exports in. But nonetheless, the exports doubled. I mean, whether there was a bad or good reasons irrelevant, they doubled. Um, unemployment at record levels, which means we are at some point got to start seeing wage inflation which means that they're rising so we've got the the u.s continuing to rise we'll probably get between now to end of next year maybe four or five increases um which takes us up to two odd percent um bank of england probably capped out ecb maybe in the next year will start to rise and, and bank of japan not at all but that is telling us that the, the crisis of 0809 is now finally flushing out of our system we're not over it and certainly led by america then europe then to a degree the uk and japan just remains uh, we were talking on the way here that uncle who sort of comes uninvited to the family event and, and you just wish you didn't have to talk about it but there is a normalization happening um, and that normalization is critically important, A, for normalization purposes, but B, because the next financial crisis, which is, you know, somewhere between one minute and, and, and 25 years away, that next financial crisis, the best weapon about it has always been lowering rates. So we've got to, in essence, be reloading for the next crisis that, that, that comes along. Um, and where does that leave us? It, it leaves us 
probably a little bit behind the curve. I don't think we, we had not got inflation worries at this point, mm -hmm. and I don't think our governor wants to raise, which does then mean that the arbitrage is, is, is getting a little, a little smaller between our rates and their and rates their for rate, the carry yeah. trade. But I expect the carry trade to probably still go on, and that then leaves us with the rand that's moving stronger. Um, and I know I've been saying it for many years, and I've been very wrong. So actually, no, this year we're flat on the year. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, Iran blows out, and then it recovers more than you ever imagined. And and around a ten fifty, nine fifty, even eight fifty, um, is is wild to think about. But in oh one, it went to thirteen sixty, and then went to five seventy five. And if December twenty first, two thousand and one, while Rand was north of thirteen, if I told you it was going to halve, you would have taken me to the crazy house. Now, truthfully, crazy house might be where I belong, but this. The question I keep on is, how do I defend against a rand at 40? And I'm like, what do you mean rand at 40? We're at 13.50 right how now. Do we even? Um, we were 11.55 <laughs> a couple of months ago. Will the rand go to 40? Yes. In our lifetime? Probably. Tomorrow? No. It, it, we, we're, we're, we're an advanced economy, particularly in the financial services space. We have monster challenges, but within that, 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 that emerging market basket, and I've said this many times before, we are the top basket case, so to speak. Yeah. We're not Turkey or Argentina or Venezuela Which or Russia or, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Are all going through a lot right yeah. now. Okay, um, Simon, thank you very much. As always, very informative and um, lots to think about, lots to consider, and hopefully next month, we'll be talking about a slightly higher market. Um, I hope so. Less trade war rubbish although from what i've seen in the headlines that's highly we can rubbish. have trade wars just give me a higher market i'm getting old <laughs> <laughs> we all want a higher market um and hopefully a less volatile rand and um i mean who knows and no elections move forward goodness please yeah. <laughs> thanks Simon. Again, thank you very much for joining us on the Long Short Podcast. If you have any topic suggestions you'd like to send through to us, please send them through to securities at standardbank.co.za. Alternatively, you could drop your suggestion in our community under the talk section. You can also tweet us at SBG Trader ZA. Thank you for listening and goodbye.